We're halfway through 2022, and while there have been some really great movies so far this year, there have also been, whoo, some real clunkers. We're talking movies that are derailing franchises and careers. Because gone are the days when moviegoers would simply see whatever new big movie was hitting the local multiplex, because with streaming bigger than ever, it's now easier than ever for audiences to pass on a film or boycott it. Hollywood used to be, what else are you gonna do this weekend? And now, you got a lot of options, baby. So without further ado, here are some of the biggest movie disasters of the year, and we still have six months to go. I would say the biggest disaster so far is Lightyear. Why? Because Pixar had the furthest to fall. Sure, they've made some lazy cash grab movies like the entire Cars franchise in the past, but this is Toy Story, damn it! The one that started it all, their top brand. Pixar was not slumming it. They felt this would be an awards contender, and it still could be, it better be. If it doesn't even get nominated, it'll be a total wash. And it was the first Pixar movie of the pandemic not to be sent straight to Disney+. Plus. It was supposed to fix everything! I think Lightyear, though, is the best example of Hollywood wearing its politics on its sleeve, from replacing Tim Allen with Chris Evans to coming up with an awards-friendly story that forgets, or even worse, intentionally gets rid of all the things about Buzz Lightyear that made him a fan favorite in the first place and over the course of decades. Although, as I said in my coverage of that movie, I feel they have been slowly diluting Buzz for the past few uh, films. Uh, we've seen Pixar headed in this direction for a while with all the manipulative crying that's become... I was the first to point it out! And then eventually everybody agreed with me that it was a little bit, you know, too much. Uh, and we'll see if they can pull up before they totally crash their brand. Next, Morbius was pretty devastating for Sony. Now, sure, a number of us felt that the movie actually wasn't that bad. But you can't deny that the people have spoken. Uh, fans do not want any more of these Spider-Man spin-offs without Spider-Man, where his greatest villains are turned into anti-heroes? As I recently said in a live stream, the slogan for Sony's Spider-Verse is, what does this have to do with Spider-Man? Uh, I also think this is a pretty big blow to Jared Leto, who social media seems to have turned on. He's like the liberal version of Chris Pratt. Despite some recent solid turns, I mean, I thought he was pretty good in Gucci, even if a bit silly. I thought that was kind of the point. But it's just clear that a lot of people don't want anything to do with Leto, and I think he's become a liability to any project he's associated with. I would think twice before hiring Leto at this point, even though I do think he's talented. Then there's Fantastic Beasts 3, another franchise at Warner Brothers along with DC that should be doing much better than it is and is existing only on fumes of how great it once was and the hope that it could be great once again. It's also alarming, I must say, for LGBT representation in Hollywood that both this film and Lightyear were DOA at the box office. Let's hope that Disney Animation's strange world that doesn't have the baggage of an existing brand, because as I've said in my coverage of Fantastic Beasts 3 and Lightyear, there are other problems with those movies, so it's not a clear-cut test. So I think Strange World will be our first really good test, is if the family movie audience will support LGBT storylines. Now back to Fantastic Beasts 3, one of Kevin Sujihara's shining moments before things got really bad for him, as the head of Warner Brothers was convincing J.K. Rowling before things got really bad for her to turn Harry Potter into the Wizarding World franchise, and of course to do it with Warner Brothers. But then Sujihara was forced to resign amid a sex scandal, while Rowling has taken an aggressive stance against the trans community, not even open to discussion, seeming to forget that a very large chunk of Harry Potter's fandom is or was LGBT. People still love Harry Potter, though, from the theme parks to the new stores, like the one in New York City. Ah, oh, that's a real treat. Fabulous. And it really reminds you what Harry Potter should be. So as Warner Brothers Discovery likely gets ready to abandon the rest of the Fantastic Beasts movies, there are supposed to be two more, let's see if they can course correct the wizarding world with the upcoming video game and very likely an HBO Max series, which is interestingly pretty much how Disney has been rehabilitating Star Wars with the video, game and the Dis video games and the Disney Plus shows. Uh, and they took a, they're taking a big break from the movies right now, and I think you can very much see the same thing with Harry Potter. And I think we should. Harry Potter also needs to take a breather. 
All right, another big flop this year has been Death on the Nile. Sure, it didn't help that Army Hammer was front and center. They tried to hide him. They were like, Army Hammer's in this movie? No. Oh, yeah, there he is. Never mind. Uh, his career blew up, of course, due to some shocking sexual abuse accusations. Now, Hammer has never been charged, but his wife did leave him over this whole thing, and he didn't deny the accusations, instead insisting that these interactions were weird but consensual. Yikes, Army Hammer. Big yikes. And we didn't forget when you let your son tuck, suck your toe, either. My God. But Death on the Nile has other problems, from way too much green screen to Gal Gadot in a lead role, where after a fabulous debut as Wonder Woman, where she was Wonder Woman, it's unfortunate that at, with every appearance she's made after that, you just can't deny that she can't act. She's actually, I'm sorry to say, and I defended her. I defended her so hard, but I must agree with the rest of you now, she can't act. Uh, Death on the Nile is a reminder that 2017's Murder on the Orient Express is actually not a good movie either, but it was helped tremendously by one amazing scene between Kenneth Branagh and Mr. Johnny Depp. When he kind of seemed like he cleaned himself up after the last Pirates movie, he was great in that film. This movie, Death on the Nile, has no such scene to pin its hat on. Uh, next, and also I think there's some romanticism to being on the train, but you know, I don't think they didn't make being on that boat as exciting. All right, next, next let's take a look at Downton Abbey, A New Era. The first film was a surprise hit. I'll never forget going to see that movie. I saw it twice. Uh, I actually saw it twice, and both times, fans in the theater were so excited, you'd swear you were at a comic book movie. It was so cute, it was so fun. I'm a Downton Abbey fan, or at least I was, like I think many people. But anyway, Downton Abbey was one of the first television shows to success, one of the few television shows to successfully jump to the big screen. Plus, there was that, the behind the scenes world tour that took the world by storm. And it seemed like Downton Abbey would be a franchise that even though the television series had ended would have a long life ahead of it. But with a two to three year break between movies and the much more dramatic and historically focused The Gilded Age debuting on HBO, Julian Fellow's American version of Downton Abbey, that's a, a lot more aggressive show. It's like Family Guy and The Simpsons. That's, I think, a really good comparison. And two seasons of, seasons of The Crown, which also got pretty juicy during that break. And then, of course, Bridgerton not only was introduced, but had two seasons. And that doesn't include classism in the fantasy. So suddenly Downton Abbey seemed a lot more quaint. Add to that the story finally becoming repetitive, it ran out of road, and Maggie Smith bowing out, I think Downton Abbey is either done or will go out with a whimper with one or two even less successful entries. So those are the big flops, but there are a couple other clunkers worth touching on. Moonfall. While audiences have been making fun of Roland Emmerich's disaster porn for a while now, they've still been willing to pay to see it. I love 2012. But not anymore. Moonfall is his least successful disaster porno to date. But like a porno, it did very well digitally where people could stream it secretly. Then Firestarter, a very rare misfire for Mr. Jason Blum, who can usually spin uh, gold out of blood and cheap remakes. Yet this one did not spark. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with it. Not even Zac Efron could save it, which should be worrisome for Efron, and I think it is, because he finally said he was ready to do another high school musical. He's like, whew, better go back to the basics. And finally, Marry Me. She's still stuck in the basics. J-Lo's fans might have had fun with this film, and to be fair to its poor box office, it did end up debuting day and date on Peacock thanks to the pandemic and the current push for streaming services. But still, J-Lo is far from her prime 20 years ago uh, when she was starring in hit after hit at the multiplex. Maybe it's because she's still making a movie that has been taken over by Hallmark and Netflix these days. Uh, so she's got to think of something else to do, like hus uh, Hustlers. You know, she might not have won an Oscar, but I think that was a nice new chapter for her. So those are the big disasters of 2022. And as I said, we still have six months to go. Uh, what do you think? Did I miss any clunkers, right? And do you think any of these franchise and or stars can turn things around? Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.